Hello everyone, my name is Dan Quintana and I'm from the University of Oslo and in this screencast I'm going to walk you through how to calculate and correct for publication bias in meta-analysis. Now this video is a companion piece to an article written by myself and my co-authors and all the details regarding the article and the data sets and the files can be found in the video description. Now, meta-analysis has become a really popular way to synthesize research across multiple different papers, but a big problem with meta-analysis is publication bias. Unfortunately, the reality is that journals are less likely to publish non-significant results. So this means when you're calculating a meta-analysis, quite often the effect sizes or the summary effect size estimates can be inflated because what's happening is that you're not, you don't have access to these unpublished articles, therefore these are not being included in meta-analysis. And this is quite a big, big issue for two reasons. Because firstly, quite often this influences the claims that are made for a meta-analysis. So if an effect size is inflated so much, it can be inflated so it becomes a significant result and these conclusions are, well, there's an effect here or there's a correlation here. And secondly, meta-analyses are often used for, uh, for power analyses. So when you're actually looking at the effect sizes that you put into a power analyses, quite often meta-analyses are used for that. But if the effect sizes are inflated from the true effect size, then power analyses are gonna be inaccurate. Quite commonly, people use um, uh, two methods to calculate publication bias. These are actually incorrect and not direct measures of publication bias, but I'm gonna quickly run through them anyway, just, to, just so you can know what to watch out for, and also to introduce you to the software they're going to be, that we're gonna be using to conduct meta-analysis. So we're gonna hop over to JASP, and this is free software that you can download, and it includes uh, tools to conduct meta-analysis. But the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna load our meta-analysis data set. Let's have a look here. Firstly, before we get to that though, um, if you don't see the meta-analysis module up here, then click on the plus menu here and click on select meta-analysis um, if it's not there. But first, let's load our data set. Open and we will find our data. Here it is. To give you a description of the data, we've got um, a column with the study names, a column with the sample size, a column with the effect size, and a column with the standard error of the effect size. So the first thing we're gonna do is we are gonna calculate a conventional meta-analysis using, measure, using um, measures which are often, which are incorrectly used to, um, to address publication bias. So click on meta-analysis, classical meta-analysis here. Effect size, drag it across there. Standard error, drag it across there. Doing some calculations, but we'll visualize this as well. One way that we, which is typically visualized, or meta-analyses are typically visualized, is via a forest plot. We can see our 18 studies here, which report our various correlations, and you can see um, uh, the effects here. And you can see the summary effect size, which is 0.24, which is reflected in the estimate up here. There's also um, a considerable heterogeneity as well for this particular study. Like I said before, um, there are two ways that people quite often uh, assess publication bias within conventional meta-analysis. And the first way is by constructing a funnel plot. Here, the funnel plot plots standard error against effect size. And in this case, if there is funnel plot asymmetry, then this can be indicative of publication bias, or at least that's what a lot of people interpret this as. However, if there is symmetry, then there is low risk of publication bias. In this particular study, the, the, the data set that this study was taken from looked at this funnel plot and concluded, well, in this case, because there is because the funnel plot is symmetrical um, between, uh, between this line here, then there is, there is little evidence of publication bias. Now you can probably see the problem there in that assessing a plot visually can be quite uh, quite subjective. And a lot of people would look at this plot and say, well, I'm not sure whether that's symmetrical. Uh, and a, a more uh, objective way of looking at funnel plot asymmetry is by calculating Eggers regression test. We're gonna click on this here, and this is calculated Eggers regression test. Typically with Eggers regression test, if the p-value is below 0.05, then you would conclude 
that there is a risk of publication bias. But in this case, it is just over 0.05. So if you were running this meta-analysis conventionally and looking at eggs regression test, many people would incorrectly say, hey, there is evidence of publication bias. So what does this actually measure? Funnel plot asymmetry is a measure of small study bias, which can include publication bias, but it's not a direct measure of publication bias. So now that we know that this is not the right way to do things, I'm going to show you some, some correct ways or some more direct ways of estimating publication bias. The first method is called pet peas. And this is an option within meta-analysis. Click on here and click on pet peas. Now with pet peas, it, it estimates two models, a pet model and a peas model. The pet model um, first assesses the presence of publication bias. And if it detects publication bias, then the P's model adjusts for this. So we're gonna do the same thing in, we're gonna be clicking on this option here for correlations in N, because that's the information that we have. We'll click on effect size here, a number here. Okay, let's have a look at pet P's. So, the first model, um, if this PET model was significant, then this would suggest there is a present, there, there is the presence of publication bias. But here, this result is not statistically significant. So given that, then we can actually use this um, uh, estimate, this PET estimate down here. And this is essentially zero. You can see by this, uh, by this scientific notation here. Um, and we can look at the upper and lower confidence interval. So this is one particular way. So if we, to, if we were to run this using pet peas, we would conclude, okay, there is no, um, there's no evidence of publication bias. And here is the, the estimate, which is essentially, essentially zero. The next thing we're gonna look at is uh, uh, selection models. We'll go back up here to meta analysis and we'll click on selection models. And the way the selection models works is it, it runs under the, I think quite plausible assumption as well in that um, um, p-values or studies with p-values that are non-significant and less likely to be published. And what selection models does is it actually weights p-values according to how likely these p-values are to be published. So if we would assume that a p-value above, above 0.05 is less likely to be published, if there are p-values above that, these are given more weight in the model, whereas p-values which are highly likely to be published, such as a p-value of 0 0.001, is given less weight in the overall model. So we'll do the same thing. Correlations in N, we'll click on effect size, we'll click on N, and we'll look at these calculations here. First thing we need to do is look at the test of heterogeneity. And this test would suggest there is, um, this, this test was uh, significant. So there, there is um, evidence for heterogeneity. So then when we're looking at a test of publication bias, we would go with um, uh, assuming heterogeneity. Now keep in mind for this particular test, it has been recommended that you use a p-value threshold of 0.1, not the traditional p-value threshold of 0.05. So in this case, we would assume, assuming heterogeneity because of this um, uh, output out here, we would use this and this would actually suggest that yes, there is the presence of publication bias. Um, because we're assuming heterogeneity, then we would use random effects estimates. And then here we would see, assuming um, um, there is a adjusting for publication bias, the estimate is 0.159 and this, is no longer statistically significant. Let's visualize this. We can see here that um, if we are, the, if we to use a random effects model because there is significant heterogeneity and we're adjusting for publication bias, it is no longer significant. And you can see the difference between the unadjusted for not adjusting for publication bias and adjusting for publication bias. There is quite a big difference there. And of course, there's differences if one were to use a fixed effects model, whether you're adjusting or not adjusting. So pet peas and selection models um, are two ways that you can detect and correct for publication bias, but these are frequentest or p-value ways of doing things. And there are some limitations when doing this for meta-analysis. 
The first one is that using p-values, you cannot quantify the evidence for the absence of publication bias. So let's say you got a non-significant result for these tests for publication bias. Like any p-value, when used in a conventional way, a non-significant p-value is either indicative of um, support for an old model, or it's indicative that your data was too insensitive or you needed more samples within your data. There is no way of knowing which one of these two things it is purely based on a p-value. So again, to reiterate, if you get a non-significant p-value, it's very difficult to quantify whether there's evidence for the absence of publication bias. The second thing is there can be some estimation problems. So if you have, um, say, a meta-analysis with only six studies, which is quite common, most meta-analyses don't have that many studies, if uh, p-value intervals, uh, if, if p-values are missing within particular intervals, so if the, you don't have many p-values between um, non-significant p-values, um, for instance, then there can be estimation problems when you are using these frequentist methods. The first one, uh, the, the third issue, of course, is with p-values, you have these all or none decisions. Um, as you would have noted, that um, so, so of, of course, uh, the, the, using the threshold 0.05 is quite arbitrary. In fact, we saw with some of these tests that the thresholds are suggested a 0.01, but if they were 0.05, then our conclusions would have been different. So you get, by, by having these thresholds, it's, it's this dichotomous, significant or non-significant. There is an alternative, and that is by using robust Bayesian meta-analyses. Um, one benefit is you can quantify the relative evidence for the absence of publication bias. So you can make the conclusion that um, there is three times more evidence for publication bias um, or for, 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 for the absence of publication bias compared, compared to the presence of publication bias. You can directly assess these things. The next one is if you have smaller samples, um, you can still perform evaluation um, of uh, you, can, you can still perform estimation if you um, if you have very few p-values in some of these uh, in some of these intervals, but you should still confirm the robustness for uh, to the prior specification. But it's less of an issue compared to frequentist p-values. And secondly, you don't need to do or don't need to make these all-in-one decisions. You can retain all your potential model your, all your models by performing model averaging. So to walk through what model averaging is, um, I'm going to give you an example. This isn't this isn't exactly what's done. Um, this is a, a smaller set of models, and I'm going to go and explain the larger set of models that's used within robust Bayesian meta analysis. But I'm doing a smaller set of models just to give you the overall concept. So we begin by um, uh, by assuming two different models, either models that there's no effect or models supporting the, the, the alternative. And we give these uh, in this particular um, in, in this particular example. We're, we're assuming uh, a 50% probability for a null model and a 50% probability for an alternative model. Now, looking at the null model within that, where we we can we can also assume assuming a null model for a fixed effect or assuming for a random effect. Keep in mind, previously for our other approaches, what we had to do is we calculated whether we were going to choose a random or a fixed effect based on a measure of study heterogeneity. Within model averaging, within Bayesian meta-analysis, you don't have to choose. You can let the models make the decisions for you because the, you can average the results or uh, average the results together or average the models together. And of course, we have assuming a fixed effect for, um, for, for, for the alternative model and assuming a random effect for the alternative model. And then, so in this particular instance, we have uh, for, for these four different models where we're where assuming um, a 25% a probability. And the plausibility of these four models are then updated within this approach using Bayes' theorem. And that models that predict the observed data produce a boost in plausibility, and then models that don't um, um, suffer a decline. So you, uh, you have this, this probability of what you anticipate your models to behave like, but then this is updated um, according to the observed data. Here's what we actually do, or here's what's, here, here's how we calculate um, the, or here are the models that we use for robust meta-analysis. We have 36 models, which goes across, <laughs> it's a lot of models, but uh, all, all the computation is done by the software. The first set of models is, um, the 18 models assume an old model, and 18 models assume an alternative model. Within that, 
um, nine assume a fixed effect and nine assume a random effect. And then we have a number of different assumptions as for publication bias. <clears throat> for each of these, uh, four of these models assume no publication bias. Um, then there's a number of models which um, use uh, selection, um, uh, selection models uh, assuming a range of different cutoffs. And we also have a PET model and a PEAS model as well. So 36 models in total. And these models are given a set of prior probabilities. These, are, these, these can of course be, um, these, these can be adjusted if you um, have a problem, if you um, don't want to use these defaults, but uh, these defaults have been demonstrated to work, uh, to work quite, quite, quite well in simulation studies. Let's go back <clears throat> to JASP and I'll show you how to run robust meta-analysis within JASP. So we we'll click on meta-analysis up here and we go to robust Bayesian meta-analysis. As before, you can see our 36 models and the prior probabilities here, which was the same as I showed you before. Typically, what you would do is you would take and you would um, enter in all your information there as well. But um, this is computationally very, very expensive. And depending on your system, it can take a long time to compute. It'll happen, but it'll take a very long time to compute. Um, it's not gonna be fun watching me stare at the screen for 10 minutes. So what you can do within JASP is you can, um, you can actually load a, a model that you fitted previously. And that's what we're gonna do. This gives you exactly the same results if you were to wait around and if you were to use the, the data using the, um, the, that you can download from the links in the video description, you can do the same thing, but we're just gonna skip we're going to look at here. Here we go. Okay. So we can see here that we have our model summary. And the first bit of this model summary is looking at the, the presence or the absence of an effect or the um, comparing models which, which assume a null effect and the comparing models which assume an effect. We can see the base factor is 1.23. So what this tells us is that there is 1.2 times more evidence for an effect versus no effect. This is quite modest. It demonstrates there really isn't that much evidence for an effect there. Um, compare this to the models comparing assuming heterogeneity and no heterogeneity. Um, there is almost 20,000 times more evidence for heterogeneity. So that's something you could, uh, you could bet the house on. There's a lot of evidence there. Looking here at publication bias, remember we had four models which assumed no publication bias and the remainder of the 32 models assumed there was, there was some sort of publication bias. When you compare those two models and when you look at the data, there is over five times more evidence for publication bias compared to no publication bias. So that's that's relatively convincing. That's, um, yeah, five times more evidence. That's, that, that, that's quite convincing. Here, we can see our model averaged estimates. So averaging across all the, all, all the 36 models, and um, we can see that the effect size, reported effect size is 1.95. And we can also see a measure of heterogeneity as well there too. And there's a number of different options for looking and calculating your forest plots as before. And you can also calculate your average weight function estimate as well if you wanna visualize those things. So that is how you can calculate publication bias and adjust for publication bias using a variety of methods. And in particular, um, there, there is some uh, limitations to frequentist p-value meta-analyses, but um, uh, Bayesian or robust Bayesian meta-analyses overcome many of these limitations. So you can create these estimates or these publication bias adjusted estimates. Uh, as uh, Like I mentioned before, we have this measure here of 1.95 is a measure which accounts for publication bias because we've considered all the models here. Hope this has been useful. Again, for more information, check out the links in the video description.